It's great to be joined today by David Patrick Karakos, who's the author of War in 140 Characters, How Social Media is Reshaping Conflict in the 21st Century. You know, David, we were just speaking earlier on the program about how if we had here in the United States um, the uh, sort of current circumstances with our president, except in the era of Richard Nixon, lacking the social media presence that we have and in a very, very different media environment, that we might be seeing a completely different progression of these sort of investigations that are currently taking place into possible misdeeds by our by our president. Do you agree that the, the sort of scope and magnitude with which social media has changed the sort of news cycle and political dialogue is is that significant? Is that is that an overstatement to some degree? No, look, I mean, we have we're caught between two stools here. On the one hand, things are different. On the other hand, we don't want to say that everything is unprecedented. But certainly, you know, in the days of social media, Nixon would have gone down a lot quicker than he did. Uh, having said that, at the same time, we are in the social media age and Donald Trump is still in power over, well over a year after he took office. I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the way in which narratives sort of start to become built up and that very often the narrative actually sort of supersedes or makes irrelevant any individual fact or story. And we've sort of seen that very, very effectively carried out, at least in the context of this investigation that we're seeing into Donald Trump, the sort of general narrative of there is a biased investigation being trumped up by the so-called fake news. And social media has been incredibly effective at furthering that narrative. Can you talk a little bit about that sort of departure or disconnect that can start to exist between the facts of any individual story and event and these overarching narratives which seem to actually be uh, much more powerful in some cases? Absolutely. Look, what you have to understand is social media is geared toward the promulgation of narratives and it is geared away from nuance. The inherent structure of social media platforms, think of a tweet. Okay, now you can say 280 characters instead of 140, but at the end of the day, it's geared towards sensationalism, geared towards virality. The truth is always more nuanced. It's always on the one hand and on the other, and no one wants to read that, and the inherent structure of social media is geared away from that. At the same time, we have a balkanization you know, we all know about the algorithms that feed us content that we think that it calculates that we think we'll like. So it feeds us uh, with content that we like and it reaffirms our own prejudices. That way there is a balkanization. Now, 20 years ago, you could have been, or 40, 50 years ago when Nixon was in power, you could have been pro Nixon, anti Nixon, but you still would have watched cable uh, network news, state TV, you would have seen the same images. Now, depending on who you friend, who you follow, what narratives you believe or choose to believe, you can have your own reality created for you, you know, on social media, which is where we get most of our news now. And what this means is that someone who disagrees with you isn't merely wrong, they're evil, they're a liar. And this creates greater mistrust, greater hatred and greater reaffirmation of prejudice. Is it useful to, you know, as I hear you describe that, is it even useful to try to measure out the sort of net impact of these changes? Because there are those who say, well, on the on the sort of on the plus side, there's so much more access much more quickly with fewer gatekeepers to information that never would have been accessible before social media, before the modern 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 news sort of paradigm. On the other hand, you have the creation of the echo chambers and the filter bubbles as a result of the algorithms that, that you're describing. Is it even a useful experiment to think about in the net? Are we better off or worse off? Or is that sort of the wrong way to think about it? Look, I mean, the, the thing is, it's, I mean, it's hard to quantify, but actually I would say at the moment, it's probably a net loss. Hmm. You know, I always say the story of social media is the story of the rise and fall of hope. In the beginning, we were told, give a man or woman access to the internet and it will set them free. And for a while, and to a degree, it does. We call this now cyber utopianism. You know, for a while, it will benefit the downtrodden. It will give a voice to the voices. But in the end, the tools used by the oppressed will always come to be used by the oppressor. And when they do it properly and when they do it well, as in the case of Russia, you see the results, which can be for everywhere from Ukraine to the U.S. presidential election. They can be catastrophic. Yeah, I mean, I think that that that's sort of the direction I, I wanted to go next, which is there was this idea of social media and the Internet as a democratizing force, an objectively democratizing force, a sort of transfer of power from the huge corporate media institutions to individuals 
networks of individuals, small groups, independent media. But to the extent that that happened initially, it seems that in the long run, those big players will take control back by being able to just funnel more money into those new platforms to some degree. Absolutely. Look, what's going to have to change? And, you know, the big change that we've seen is the difference, the shift in power between hierarchies and networks, it's hierarchies and citizens and individual networks, individuals and networks of individuals now. What we're seeing, funnily enough, and Alec Ross was the one who was Secretary of Innovation to Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, who told me about this shift, he's absolutely right. But what we're seeing is the hierarchies employing the power of networks. And that means Russia, in the end, setting up these troll farms, creating networks of propagandists. It is true that power has gone from, you know, has diffused from nation states, from big governments, from big corporations, to networks of individuals. And the smart players, like Russia, are creating their own networks of bad actors in response. We saw this with Cambridge Analytica as well. The good guys working in bureaucracies like the State Department, where every decision has to go up the chain of command, who are risk averse, who are slow, who are bloated, we are behind and we are losing. And there is another point here, is that we are constrained by dip diplomatic and democratic norms that bad actors like Putin are not. Uh, if you tried to set up a, a troll farm in New York, give it a month, the New York Times would expose it. The troll farm in St. Petersburg has been exposed countless times, not least in my book. But at the end of the day, Putin is not accountable to the press. He's not accountable to his people. So we are behind the curve. David, is there any practical difference uh, when you th talk about, uh, you know, a legacy media company using the bully pulpit to include or exclude whatever they want from from the narrative, so to speak, and that power being transferred to a company like Facebook through its algorithm or Google through search results. Is it just two sides of the same coin or is there any practical difference? There's a huge practical difference in that the power of the algorithm and the network and the platform is far greater than that of the New York Times. Mm. The New York Times is now is now entirely reliant, not entirely, but is hugely reliant on Facebook to get its uh, content out there. Uh, the, yeah, the, 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 practically, yes, there is one of power, and the power is of a different order of magnitude. And I use that expression specifically and carefully. What is the uh, what's the solution to this if there is one? I mean, in other words, what what is it that you propose or that we should be considering yeah. as a way to Everyone take this power back? Said, um, yeah. Hey, look, I hear you. Everyone says this. But look, you know, at every stage in history of the advancement of information technology, be it the printing press and the expansion of TV and radio, we have seen a, a, you know, a subsequent period of instability. This is what we're in now. We're still in the Wild West days of social media, this new information technology. I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. But I think at some point, you know, the government is going to have to step in. Some kind of leg regulation or preferably legislation is going to have to come in. And I think we're going to have to do practical things like we're going to have to start putting social media literacy on school curriculums. We're going to have to start getting people educated. And at some point, uh, the government is going to have to step in because self-policing is not working. Are you of the mindset as I am? And I'd be curious to hear based on what you've written in the book that any sort of government approved list or government rankings of media outlets is inherently very dangerous? Yes, it is dangerous. This is the problem. Look, we fundamentally don't know. Now, look, social media companies have a default free speech libertarian model, and that is absolutely correct. But there is a difference between free speech, which is right and legal, and incitement to violence, which is illegal. I give you honestly, five minutes, you'll find that sort of stuff on any platform you go on. This sort of stuff needs to be cut out. The problem is, it is not illegal to lie. You know, that's not a crime, nor should it be a crime. If mm. we start making it you know, illegal to lie, then we've got big problems. So, you know, it is an incredibly complex problem, both practically and philosophically. How do you do it? The point is, I think what you have to do is set clear boundaries. Look, incitement to violence is clear. There should not be jihadist content that is getting people to go to Syria on Facebook and Twitter. And there is. So stuff like that, you find people heavily, you hit them where it hurts, which is always in the wallet. You start with stuff like that, ranking things, saying what's good, what's bad. We get into realms of subjectivity and whose truth is right. And beyond, I mean, beyond facts, I mean, you know, I mean, we can't start saying, well, if you're a conservative, you're this, if you're a liberal, you're that. So I agree with you, it's fundamentally dangerous, but there are some initial practical steps that can be taken and need to be taken. David, I know you've got limited time. Last thing I wanted to touch on is you, you mentioned how things are very, very different in Russia, for example, with regards to something like a troll farm. Among the sure. sort of 
Western democracies, do you see that there are philosophical differences in terms of how different countries would be inclined to deal with this that are important? Or do you feel that the Western democracies are more or less on the same page with this issue? Look, there's a fundamental, I mean, look, we're more or less on the same page. And I've, I've done work in this area in counter disinformation. But, you know, there is a difference between uh, you know, I think that we're going to see an increasingly a, a European Internet and an American Internet. Hmm. America has the First Amendment. We obviously have free speech in Europe as well. But there is more appetite here to regulate. There is more appetite to legislate than in the US. So I think we're broadly on the same page. We're all, you know, Western democracies. But I think uh, you're going to see slightly, a slightly tightening of the Internet in Europe as opposed to the US. David Patrikarikos, the book is War in 140 Characters. I really appreciate you making time for us today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.